if you are over 60 and wondering if you should eat any differently now compared to when you were younger, you've come to the right video because here's what you can expect to learn. First, I want to make one assumption about you, so stay tuned for that. And second of all, what's the same for uh, people over 60 versus what's different? Uh, what should you be changing or what should you be keeping the same? That's exactly what we're going to cover in this video. There are three specific things that are different, which you're going to learn towards the end. So um, before we jump in, who am I? My name is Igor. I'm the author of 13 books on exercise and nutrition, including four Amazon bestsellers on things like osteoporosis, high blood pressure, type 2 diabetes, and others. I've been a personal trainer since 2006, and I've been teaching my methodology to other personal trainers since 2013 by speaking at other personal training conferences. As well, I've done over 400 presentations to some of Canada's largest corporations, including IBM, Bosch, American Express, University of Toronto, Investors Group, and others. If you want to learn when I publish more uh, videos on exercise and nutrition for people over 60, click like and subscribe to my channel. So I'm going to make one big assumption here, and that is that the only thing we know about you, the viewer, is your age. We know that you are over 60. We're, just, we're assuming that you don't have conditions because if you do, um, I have other videos about nutrition for osteoporosis and strengthening your bones. Uh, I have a video about foods that lower high blood pressure and foods that reverse um, type 2 diabetes and others. But for the sake of this video, we're just going to assume that you're over 60 and don't have any of these conditions. So first, let's talk about what is the same for the, uh, for, for the elderly. Here's what's the same. Just as when you were younger, you needed lots of fruits and vegetables, well, you now need to say the same thing. Uh, lots of veggies and a few fruits here and there. The fiber requirements are basically the same or very, very similar. You should be eating approximately 14 grams of fiber per thousand calories. Uh, the best sources of fiber, of course, are fruits, vegetables, um, nuts and seeds, uh, beans, legumes, lentils, uh, peas, etc. Now, what's different? There are a few differences, not any major ones, but here are a few. Here is one very large study titled Nutritional Problems of the Elderly. In that study, they found widespread vitamin and mineral deficiencies for three specific reasons. Reason number one is the loss of smell and taste. And as a result, the elderly tend to eat the same foods over and over and over without diversity because these are the foods that they are familiar with. Reason number two, for widespread vitamin and mineral deficiencies is a loss in appetite. So not only are they eating the same foods, they're eating less of them. And three, even if they were eating the same amount, their absorption decreases. So they might be eating the same nutritious food, they just can't extract those vitamins and minerals from the food as well as they used to when they were younger. So these are the three reasons why they are widespread vitamin and mineral deficiencies. Now, here is how you plug that. A generally good practice is just take a multivitamin. In one study titled Multivitamin Supplementation Improves Memory in Older Adults Well, the, 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 the title is self-evident. It showed that by supplementing, the elderly improved their memory. Now, there is lots of research on multivitamins showing they don't improve longevity, don't increase the number of years that you live, but they increase the life in your years, if not the years in your life. Um, the other one is vitamin D. This, I mean, it's, why, it's a widespread deficiency, but it's even more prevalent in those over 60. But why is it important? What does vitamin D do? Vitamin D is important for bone formation. And in my osteoporosis videos, I talk about the importance of vitamin D for bone health. It's also important for brain health, as well as mood and muscle function. Um, people with vitamin D deficiencies have weak muscles, which also leads to weak bones. So don't just assume that you're low in vitamin D because you might not be. It's a good assumption, but it's not a perfect assumption. It's better to get measured as opposed to making assumptions. So don't just take it, get tested first. And if it's low, take it because there are risks to taking it when your blood levels are normal. If you're normal, you don't need it. If you're low, then you need it. To go from deficient to sufficient is very beneficial. Sufficient to excessive, is not a good thing. It's harmful and, and has negative consequences in your kidneys, your arteries, and your bones. Um, vitamin B12. What are some of the symptoms of deficiency of B12? Well, one is muscle weakness, difficulty walking, 
irritability, fatigue, forgetfulness, and slower thinking. Do those sound like they overlap with the symptoms of Alzheimer's or, or, or dementia? Absolutely. And all it might be is a vitamin B12 deficiency. So again, get tested. And if you're low, supplement with it. Um, or if you don't want to supplement, what can you eat that is high in B12? Well, here are the best sources. Beef liver, clams, oysters, mussels, and sardines. Now, if you're looking at, these, at this list and you're getting slightly nauseous, the alternative, of course, is to use a supplement, which is tasteless, odorless, and problem, it, it might even raise your B12 levels better than these foods. Because again, these foods contain B12, but if your absorption is compromised or is limited, you might as well take a supplement which improves absorption and gets absorbed better. Um, now, protein. Protein requirements are also different uh, as somebody gets older. Here is one study titled, Protein Consumption and the Elderly. What is the optimal level of intake? Well, that study showed that protein requirements of the elderly are higher. Why? Because absorption is lower. So how much protein should you eat? Protein requirements depend on three factors. One is your activity levels. Are you sedentary? Are you doing cardio only? Are you doing strength training only? Or are you doing cardio plus strength training? That's criteria number one. Criterion number two is your age, over 60 or under 60. And criteria number three is your body weight. The heavier you are, the more protein you need. And so if you want, feel free to pause this video, look at these numbers and plug in those variables. Or if you don't feel like doing arithmetic, just visit this website, which is in the description below. Um, and you can just plug in your variables and it'll spit out a number personalized to you based on how much protein you need. It's www.fitness solutionsplus.ca slash protein, which again is also in, in the description below. Now, if you're wondering, what are the best protein sources? Here is what I call grade A protein. Grade A protein is anything with more than 30 grams of protein per serving. There is tuna, protein powder, shrimp, beef, and chicken, especially chicken breast, chicken thighs, etc. Now, this list is not exhaustive. There are other grade A protein, but these are just a few examples. There is also grade B protein. I consider anything between 10 and 30 grams of protein per serving to be, to be grade B protein. One example is chickpeas at 12 to 14 grams per serving. Greek yogurt, about 12 grams per serving. Lentils, 16 to 18 grams per serving. And beans, 12 to 14 grams per serving. Finally, there is grade C protein. That's things that people say are high in protein, but are actually not high in protein. Uh, they have less than 10 grams of protein per serving. One slice of cheese or one cube of cheese um, has about five or six grams of protein. The exception being cottage cheese, which is significantly higher. A medium-sized egg only has about six grams of protein. Egg whites, however, have a lot more protein. Uh, one cup of milk has only nine grams of protein. There is not a single vegetable that's high in protein. Almost all vegetables are below five grams of protein and nuts and seeds are pretty low in protein as well. One handful only has about five or six grams. So these are not good sources of protein. Next, um, if you wanna know the protein content of other foods, if you're thinking, what about this? What about that? Same thing, visit this website on your screen right now and in the description below, type in the food that you want and it'll tell you how much protein is in that food. Um, now here's the ca a giant cash 22. Protein requirements are higher, but the appetite for protein is lower. In life is cruel, you know? Um, so what can be done to overcome this cash 22? Well, here are a few suggestions. And this is not exhaustive. Here are just a few um, strategies that I've used with my clients. One is if you already eat porridge or cereal or anything that has milk as an ingredient, switch to high protein milk. Um, there is a company called uh, AgroPure and a product called Natrell. I have zero affiliation, financial or otherwise, with this company. So whether you buy this or not, I don't make any money. Um, but this, um, this product contains 18 grams of protein per serving in comparison to regular milk, which contains 9 grams of protein per serving or per cup. Another one is to just add in away protein supplementation. So if you're eating your cereal or porridge, in addition to the high protein milk, add in a scoop of whey protein. All together, this will, this will give your breakfast at least 50 grams of protein. Uh, and that's a hefty breakfast. Another suggestion is to just eat more protein. If you already eat chicken for dinner, 
have you know uh, a chicken breast and a half or two chicken breasts. Um, if you already eat you know a slice of salmon, have two slices of salmon. And a fourth suggestion is to add in something called EAA supplementation. That stands for essential amino acids. Um, my favorite company for this um, is Intra HD. Same thing here. I have no financial affiliation, whether you buy it or not. I don't care. Um, but this is the only one that, in my opinion, tastes good. Most EAA supplementation is, is, is either extremely sweet or extremely bitter. Um, Intra HD is, in my opinion, the only one that actually tastes good. Um, and then, by the way, if you're wondering, what are EAAs? Well, EAAs are something called essential amino acids. What does that mean? Well, imagine that protein is a necklace, and each bead in that necklace is an amino acid. So amino acids are the building blocks of protein. There are 20 amino acids in total, and eight out of those 20 are considered essential amino acids. In the world of nutrition, the word essential does not mean important. The word essential means you have to get it through food. In other words, eight of the 20 can get through food. The other 12 out of 20 can be synthesized from those eight. So essential amino acids are just those eight out of 20. So here's a study titled The Efficacy of Essential Amino Acid Supplementation for Augmenting Dietary Protein Intake in Older Adults. Uh, basically, the message is that EAA supplementation works if somebody is on a low protein diet, which a lot of people over 60 are, okay? Um, and it's especially good, EAAs, for people with a low appetite because unlike whey protein or unlike meat or fish or seafood, it's not very filling. So even if you don't feel like eating, you can get this easily. Now, nutrition is just one side of maintaining or even improving your strength if you're over 60. The other component of improving your strength tremendously is actually strength training. And I have a very, very thorough 35 minute video about how to strength train if you're over 60 properly, how to use proper technique, how to mod modify exercises if it bothers your joints and actually how to get stronger. Check that out on your screen right now and in the description below.